Indiana News Desk is made possible in part by the following. IU Health Southern Indiana Physicians, Primary Care and Specialty Care Providers now accepting new patients in Bloomington and throughout South Central Indiana. SIPhysicians.org, IU Center for Applied Cybersecurity Research, working to improve cybersecurity and provide policy guidance through partnerships with industry, government, and academia. Smithville Fiber, the Gigacity Company, Fiber Internet, HD, and Digital IPTV in Southern Indiana. More information at smithville.com. And by WTIU members. Thank you. Coming up on Indiana News Desk, the makers of an online vision test say they're increasing access to eye exams in underserved populations. But many optometrists say you can't replace a comprehensive in-person eye exam. The prescription is not simply which is better one or two and that's not what you get. It's kind of an amalgam of all those different pieces put together and a computer can't do that. We'll tell you why Hoosiers won't be able to use the new health service. And you won't see it on top of the lake, but Eurasian milfoil is a threat to boaters and recreation. It lingers in shallow waters and along shorelines. And uh, actually from reports, news reports, and uh, just lore around the lake in the 70s and 80s, it was so bad that you honestly couldn't use the lake almost at all. Find out how boater registration fees are being used to combat the problem. Those stories, plus the latest news headlines from across the state, right now on Indiana News Desk. Welcome to Indiana News Desk. I'm Barbara Brozier, in tonight for Joe Wren. More business is conducted online all the time. One of the latest startups is an online eye exam. It's called Opternative, and it allows people to test their vision without having to set foot in a doctor's office. But soon, it won't be an option for Hoosiers. A telemedicine law going into effect next month means the company will be prohibited from operating in Indiana. We use them for just about everything. With the touch of a few buttons, you can order pizza, look up directions, even deposit a check into your bank account. And now a Chicago startup says you can use your phone to help test your vision. Alternative is an easy to use way to get a prescription for glasses and contacts that is issued by a doctor an ophthalmologist license in your state. The online exam tests for refractive error and provides people with a contact lens or glasses prescription within 24 hours. So here's how it works. After you answer a series of questions, the website instructs you to get into a dark room. So we have the lights off here. And then you complete a series of tests using both your computer and then your smartphone to indicate your answers to all of those tests. This one is very similar to something that you might do in a routine eye exam. You're supposed to cover one eye and then indicate what number you're seeing on the screen. Our technology is increasing access to eye care for patients all around this country. And we have so many patients who are able to use it in ways that would make it so that they couldn't access eye care any other way. Not everyone can use the service. Opternative is only offered in 33 states with plans to expand. At least three states have passed legislation banning the company. In Indiana, a new telemedicine law that goes into effect July 1st bans Opternative from offering its services to Hoosiers. While the bill allows doctors to write some prescriptions without seeing a patient in person, it prohibits the prescription of contacts, glasses, or low vision devices through telemedicine. Opternative CEO says the law is anti-consumer. The optometrists feel that technology is a threat to their business. And they held the Indiana telehealth bill hostage and threatened to kill it if prescribing glasses and contacts was not banned in the new law. So this would be an individual image of a slice through the cornea. But Associate Dean for Clinics and All Care Patient Services at IU's School of Optometry, Neil Pence, says that's not the case. He says the law aims to ensure the safety of consumers. Telemedicine is to have a patient interview uh, to have a doctor 
a physician, a physician's assistant, a nurse, nurse practitioner, actually uh, interview the patient, actually be able to see the patient, so with live video. Uh, so there are various restrictions that define what a telemedicine encounter would be. Uh, theirs does not fall anywhere close to what would be allowed. Alternative touts a more than 99% customer satisfaction rate, but Pence says there's no evidence their vision screenings are as effective as traditional exams. The American Optometric Association filed a complaint with the Food and Drug Administration earlier this year, claiming Alternative poses a risk to public health and is in violation of federal law because it didn't go through the pre-market approval process. Dr. Christopher Browning says no online technology can duplicate the benefits of an in-person visit to an optometrist. At his Greenwood office, there are about a dozen instruments used to gather various information about people's eyes, and the screenings go well beyond testing vision. A lot of patients that have diabetes don't know that they do, and it's detected by their optometrist or ophthalmologist first. Optometrists can also detect neurological problems during routine exams. And while they may be more expensive than using a service like Opternative, Browning says patients get much more for their money. There is more to value than just how much something costs. So you can't put a price on how much your eyes are worth or how much your eyesight's worth. Worth. It's uh, you know the, the most important sense for sure. But the founders of Alternative insist they're just trying to increase access to eye exams for underserved populations. There is no reason we can't help an Indiana farmer that is 40 to 50 miles away from the nearest optometrist to get a prescription for glasses or contact contacts. That's the whole point of making telehealth available in Indiana. Alternative CEO says he plans to challenge Indiana's law. So far, more than 65,000 people have signed up for Alternative. The Supreme Court of the United States upheld a decision that supported the University of Texas's affirmative action program. Now, the case centered on a student, Abigail Fisher, who sued the University of Texas as she felt she was being discriminated against for being white. Steve Sanders is a professor at IU's Maurer School of Law. He's here to help us understand this case and this decision. Thanks so much for being here Happy today. To be here, Barbara. Uh, so let's break this down. What changes based on, on this ruling? This is not a new debate about affirmative action. No, the bottom line for universities like Indiana University and others in the state is that the status quo continues. This is only this case uh, was the latest chapter in a battle that's been going on at the Supreme Court since 2003 about the constitutionality of affirmative action programs in higher education. This case was brought by opponents of affirmative action seeking to scale back further or eliminate it altogether. Instead, the decision they got from a court that only had seven people participating because of Justice Scalia's death and, just, and Justice Kagan recusing herself was a very narrow decision that focused on the specific circumstances at the University of Texas and basically left in place the ability of all other public universities to do affirmative action the way they're doing it right now. How exactly do these programs work? Because while they're allowed, there are certain things that universities cannot do. That's right. The uh, court said in 2003 in the Grutter decision that um, universities may engage in a very limited consideration of race. No quotas, no automatic numbers of points for race or ethnicity. Um, consideration of race must be done as part of a holistic review of all of an applicant's credentials. In other words, it can be one aspect of, a, of the strengths and the quality that a student brings, but it has to be in the context of their overall portfolio, their academic achievement, their letters of recommendation, other personal characteristics that they would bring to that class. Do you think we'll ever see affirmative action go away? Do you think we're ever going to get to that point? Well, I don't think so, because um, the premise of the way the court has said affirmative action may be done is that it is a benefit to educational institutions to be able to choose a student body that's broadly representative and that racial and ethnic diversity is beneficial not just to the students who get admitted, but to their classmates and to the overall learning environment. And so I think that likely won't change. Uh, the court is signaling it will defer to the judgment of educators about how they put together the composition of their incoming classes. Thank you so much for being sure. here. We surely appreciate Happy it. Happy to be here.
Now for headlines, we go over to Lindsay Wright, who has the latest on this week's top stories. Thanks, Barbara. The FBI arrested a Brownsburg teen earlier this week for allegedly trying to join ISIL. Agents arrested 18-year-old Akram Musla when he was trying to board a bus from Indianapolis to New York, where he planned to fly out to Morocco and then on to ISIL-controlled territory. While visiting NSA Crane with Secretary of Defense Ash Carter, Senator Joe Donnelly praised the work of law enforcement enforcement and helping quell the recent surge in homegrown terrorism. I think we have to be incredibly vigilant, but it also tells you how talented our FBI, U.S. Marshals, U.S. Attorney, all the local police forces, all the county forces, everybody's in this together. There's no stovepipes. We're here to keep our people safe, and if you see something, let us know. Musla is being charged with providing material support to the Islamic State. Federal prosecutors say Musla should be held until trial because he's a flight risk. The U.S. Senate voted down four gun control amendments this week. Indiana Senator Joe Donnelly was the only Democrat to vote in favor of a measure that would make it more difficult to add mentally ill people to the background check database, while also increasing funding of the background check system without expanding it. Indiana's two senators disagreed on the vote that would have allowed the attorney general to deny a gun sale if there is a reason to believe the person is involved in terrorism. Donnelly voted for the amendment. Senator Dan Coats voted against it. Both voted for the amendment that allows the government to block the purchase with a three-day review period. Many legislators protested a lack of congressional action on voting for gun regulation, regulations by hosting a sit-in. Representative Andre Carson from Indiana was one of about 30 Democratic representatives to participate in that protest. Governor Mike Pence is praising a Supreme Court ruling that effectively strikes down President Barack Obama's executive order on immigration. Indiana was one of 26 states challenging the unilateral immigration action Obama made after he said Congress wasn't acting on immigration reform. The move would have prevented deportation for millions of people in the country illegally. A $92 million renovation project is underway on the stretch of I-69 that goes through Hamilton County. The 15-mile stretch will get an additional lane in each direction. It will also see improvements to bridges and exit ramps. And I think the infrastructure of the state of Indiana and our ability uh, not only to make things and grow things but to move things has been a key part of our success and it will continue to be. The project is a part of Major Moves 2020, a project aimed at improving Indiana's infrastructure. Construction is expected to be complete in the year 2017. A Kentucky man is facing the rare charge of timber theft in Indiana, which could land him up to 10 months in prison. This is the first time someone has been charged for timber theft in the state. Cheyenne Allen is accused of stealing black walnut trees, which are the most valuable trees found in Indiana. After Allen stole and sold the timber, it got as far as Austria, Germany, and Indonesia. The Precision Health Initiative has been awarded the first round of $300 million in research funding from Indiana University. IU's Grand Challenges program aims to invest large amounts of money into tackling big problems. The Precision Health Initiative plans to use the money to cure illnesses. Over the next 10 years, within IU, we will cure at least one cancer we will cure at least one childhood disease and we will create prevention methods for at least one chronic disease and one neurodegenerative disease. The project will hire 40 new full-time faculty members and support the creation of new facilities including new gene editing and sequencing cores. Dozens of dogs are getting a fresh start after the Owen County Humane Society rescued them from a hoarding situation in May. As Barbara Brozier reports, neighboring communities are coming together to give those dogs new homes. Let's go. This little dog named Buck follows his owner around wherever she goes. If I'm going to brush my teeth, if I'm going to do laundry, go to make a sandwich, he follows me everywhere and he just sits there and waits for me to be finished. So it may surprise you to learn they've known each other for less than a month. We knew that we had to take him home. 
Buck is just one of 82 dogs rescued from a home in Owen County where the animals were living in filthy conditions. The Humane Society doesn't know much about the dogs or what they went through, but you can faintly see where someone carved initials into the top of Buck's head. Many of the other dogs were in worse shape. When the state vet comes in, they do a body score, and uh, from one to zero to five, zero is deceased. Uh, five is relatively healthy, actually chubby. Um, 85% of the dogs came in at two or below. Many of the dogs needed special attention, which is more than Owen County's Humane Society could handle alone. It was at least double their natural capacity, so they didn't have um, long-term placement for these dogs to get them well and get them going, so they asked for assistance from other shelters around. Bloomington Animal Care and Control took in 19 dogs. About half of them are already in new homes. Some still have to regain their health in foster homes or at the shelter before being adopted. The group that we got here, um, even though they were from a bad hoarding situation, the group we got are very well socialized and very sweet. Buck still needs a little extra care. He gets nervous around new people and is frightened by loud noises. But that's okay with Crumb because he already feels like part of the family. He definitely makes um, the end of my day when I come home from work a little bit more special. For Indiana News Desk, I'm Barbara Brozier. And Barbara, members of the community also help the Owen County Shelter by donating food and supplies to those dogs. It's amazing to see the community come together to help when it's needed. Exactly. Thanks, Lindsay. Coming up next on Indiana News Desk. We'll go to Lake Lemon, where an invasive species is causing trouble for boaters. We'll tell you how boat registration fees are combating the plants. And we'll visit a brewery that is planning a unique beer festival this fall. These stories and more right here on Indiana News Desk. The fact that PBS is the most trusted media outlet in the country means a great deal to me. We live now in the most multicultural, multiracial, multi-ethnic America ever. There are a lot of voices in this country that need to be heard. And I think that my job is to help Americans re-examine the assumptions that they hold, to expand their inventory of ideas, and hopefully to introduce Americans to each other. And we take that challenge seriously every day. People are looking for more light and less heat. Washington Week viewers are going to get it straight ahead, and that's what they count on us for. When we do these road shows, it not only helps me, but it helps all of our panelists to find out what is really on people's minds. We want to let you know what the information is, and then you decide what you want to think. That's what I think is unique about public broadcasting. There's nothing else like it out there. Welcome back to Indiana News Desk. Invasive species can be a nuisance for property owners and can also negatively impact the environment as a whole. Sophia Salaby takes a look at what managers of one local lake are doing to stop the spread of invasive plants. For Susan Snyder Salmon, Monroe County's Lake Lemon has been a constant in her life. She's owned property on the lake since 1998, but she first lived there as a child. Her husband also grew up on the opposite side of the lake, and this connection brought the two together. He was at the East End at Salmon Harbor in that area where his family developed the area. And I grew up near Riddle Point, uh, spending most of my time in, in the West End. In the 70s, Salmon worked as a beach manager, Something's and one happened. of her jobs was shoreline. She often found it covered with an invasive plant to Indiana called Eurasian water milfoil. At one point, it was so prevalent in the lake, it became impossible to drive boats through the water without a cleared path. And we would come in on Monday mornings after a very busy weekend and find the entire beach just covered with uh, Eurasian milfoil, piles of it. So we'd come in early and have to rake that up and then that would dry, be dried and burned. Eurasian water milfoil made its way from Europe and Asia to approximately 126,000 acres of lakes and impoundments across the state and continues to be a problem today at Lake Lemon. While you won't see it completely covering the lake, the plant can be found in shallow waters and near shorelines. It affects recreation, including swimming, fishing, and boating. It, it can range anywhere from you know two feet long to if it's in deep water, it can grow as, as uh, tall as 10 feet. But it's a small stalk with tufts of leaves that come off of it. 
The lake budgets about $50,000 a year to treat the milfoil and other invasive plants, and the State Department of Natural Resources kicks in about $5,000. That money comes from the DNR's Lake and River Enhancement, or LAIR, program, whose funds are paid for by annual boater registration fees. Every year, a third of the program's money goes to aquatic vegetation management, and this spring, LAIR awarded nearly $600,000 to 42 lake projects to combat invasive plants. Lake Lemon has a history of Eurasian water milfoil. We've been treating that as a maintenance lake out there for many years. Um, we call that a maintenance lake because there's not enough layer money available to treat all that's out there. And the Conservancy District does a good job to try to capture all the Eurasian water milfoil growth out there and to try to treat it all. Casey uses the money to pay for outside contractors who survey the lake and treat it with chemicals that directly target invasive plants without harming native plants and fish. In the winter, he brings the lake's level down by a few feet in an effort to kill off invasive plant roots. But ultimately, he says it's up to lake visitors to help stop the spread of invasive plants from lake to lake. The biggest thing about that is just education from boaters, um, getting them to clean off their hulls, dump out their live well water, any type of water that their boat has taken on. It's really just trying to, when you get to the areas, any water you take on, any potential animals, you want to stop there, you want to release everything out, clean it before you leave the lake. As someone who's lived on the lake for most of her life, Salmon understands this responsibility. She's even involved with the group Monroe County Identify and Reduce Invasive Species, which seeks to educate the community on the threat of invasive species like Eurasian water milfoil. We didn't get to this point either on our land species or in, in the lake by accident. Uh, someone introduced these species or they came in through a boat owner not cleaning off uh, their propellers or, or their bilge water. And Havlin says taking care of the environment now is one of the most important ways of preserving it for future generations. It's important to be good stewards of our environment for future generations. If you grow up on a lake, there's always those fond memories of, oh, I grew up on this lake and this is what it used to be like and this is how I remember it. So for future generations, it's important. It's important for the environment. For Indiana News Desk, I'm Sophia Salaby. In good news, the lake managers have just treated Lake Lemon for some of those invasive plants, so the lake will be ready for the upcoming 4th of July celebrations. A Columbus, Indiana brewery is already preparing for the following season with an event that combines two fall favorites. 450 North Brewing Company planted corn for large maize. As Emma Creekbaum reports, this October, the corn maize will be home to a unique beer festival that's the first of its kind. Like any other cornfield, the beginning stages of corn sprouts are usually four inches high, but these aren't typical rows between each line of plants, and for good reason. In the fall, rather than harvesting this field, the owners will open it to the public as a corn maze and a beer festival. So we came up with the idea for a corn maze first uh, as kind of a, an event to have in the fall. And then it quickly turned into, well, let's turn it into a beer festival. Actual brewery stations with local craft beer will be set up inside the corn maze. They'll have unlimited samples. And by doing this, we're kind of tying in craft beer with agriculture because, after all, beer is made from grain and hops, which are all agricultural products. So we're just tying the two together. So those people who have never had an experience of coming out to a cornfield or a farm We'll be able to not only enjoy the farm, but also the craft beer aspect of it as well. Corn maze designing and cutting professionals from Utah are visiting the farm this week to begin work on the design. In future years, we hope to make this even more popular and more bigger and make it more of a regional draw and make it a very popular event for the state of Indiana. For Indiana News Desk, I'm Emma Creekbaum. Simmons is pre-selling tickets. The maze will only be open for one day, October 1st. He's capping ticket sales at 2000. The Columbus City Council voted in favor of changing language in a city ordinance that would classify chickens as farm animals. The amendment would also disallow Columbus residents from keeping farm animals as pets in the city. The current legislation has vague guidelines, and the only restriction is that residents can own up to six chickens in residential areas. The council is set to vote again on the amendment on July 5th. 
And chicken owners throughout the state should be aware urban coyote encounters are more common than ever before. That's according to the Department of Natural Resources. They say that is due to urban expansion. Coyotes have proven to be incredibly adaptive to human environments. Law enforcement officials have seen increased reports of coyote attacks on family pets, but according to the DNR, most maintain their wild diet and remain afraid of humans. A Purdue alumnus will be aboard International Space Station Expeditions 53 and 54 next year. Astronaut Scott Tingle will carry a small package during his mission that contains special items from Purdue. The package will contain the Neil A. Armstrong Medal of Excellence. Upon Tingle's return, the medal will be displayed on Purdue's campus. Lindsay, I have to know, what would you take to space if I was, you went? I was going to ask you the same question. That's really special, but I, I, I'd pick candy or, some, <laughs> or something like that. Because you want to have it to eat. I was thinking, I thought food immediately, too. But That's something the first thing I special, maybe a family photo would be good. Yeah, I'll, I'll put some thought into it. I feel like Hoosiers would want a basketball to somehow make its way up to space. That's a good idea. All right, thanks so much. Mm -hmm. That's the end of this program, but our work continues online as we cover the news throughout the week at WTIUnews.org. Have a great weekend. Indiana News Desk is made possible in part by the following. IU Health Southern Indiana Physicians, Primary Care and Specialty Care Providers now accepting new patients in Bloomington and throughout South Central Indiana. SIPhysicians.org, IU Center for Applied Cybersecurity Research, working to improve cybersecurity and provide policy guidance through partnerships with industry, government and academia. Smithville Fiber, the Gigacity Company, Fiber Internet, HD, and Digital IPTV in Southern Indiana. More information at smithville.com. And by WTIU members. Thank you.